This state of play production is made possible by the generous support of Biogen, Biogen, where science meets humanity. Now joining us is Rick Sammons with the ILO, that's the International Labor Organization in Geneva. And Rick has an outstanding uh, career. He was with the World Economic Forum. Uh, he also spent some time in the White House during the Clinton administration as a senior economic policy advisor, mostly focused on international economics. Rick, thank you for joining us. Thank you, Karen. Great to be here. So um, maybe just briefly, Rick, would you just describe the ILO for our audience? I'm not sure um, they know who the ILO is. The ILO uh, is one of the oldest international organizations. It was created uh, after World War I and after the Spanish flu uh, uh, pandemic, as a matter of fact. Uh, and it is unique uh, in that it predates the UN system. It really came out of negotiations in the League of Nations. Um, and moreover, it isn't just purely an intergovernmental organization. It has an unusual structure in that it is tripartite. Its governing body includes not only governments, but also employers and workers organizations. And substantively, its mandate essentially is labor markets, labor standards in particular. That's its huge contribution in the first several decades, was, which was to create a global uh, uh, set of uh, labor standards and social security standards uh, involving all member countries and their stakeholders around the world. And it, it views its role as promoting decent work, which we can get into a little bit later in the discussion, and advancing social justice. So I didn't realize it came into being just following the Spanish flu. Um, so Listen, the, pan the global pandemic has wreaked havoc with the global economy. I know you just came off of your November governing body meeting. Give us a sense of the, the discussion. You know, we've had an unusual year like everybody else. And uh, usually, as you will know, Karen, there is a, uh, a conference, which is an enormous uh, a discussion among all governments, workers and employers organizations on some specified topics. It usually happens in June. And indeed we held it in June after having missed 2020 because of the pandemic, but we did manage to hold it in June, but couldn't because we needed to do it in a virtual manner. Uh, and that involved really only three hours a day. So you could get pretty much all the world's time zones uh, to be able to overlap and participate. We couldn't do all the business at once. So we, we split the conference into two parts, one in June, and then a couple of key working parties uh, to take place in December. And we've just concluded those two uh, latter discussions, one on skills and the other one on inequality. And I'm sure that the global pandemic was central uh, to the discussion. Um, and you referred to decent work. Can the ILO play a role in getting the global economy back and back into balance so we don't have the vast uh, gaps in wealth that, that we saw as a result of the pandemic? I, I certainly think so. It's one of the reasons uh, I've been motivated to be here working with the uh, ILO in that um, I think most uh, people will recognize that you know, labor standards, labor rights issues, uh, social protection systems have become newly important in political discourse and in the priorities that many policymakers place on economic performance in the last couple of years. And that, that's essentially at an international level, the, uh, the remit of the ILO. And so there's been increased demand by countries and other stakeholders for uh, information about what's going on, how are workers of various different sectors and different types of uh, working arrangements, how are they being affected by this pandemic? Is it similar? Is it different? Uh, what can be done? What are good practices and good policies to help to protect frontline workers or even workers who may not be publicly facing, but nevertheless are in really critical supply chains and the like. Um, and then uh, social protection and fiscal stimulus to basically su support people, help them uh, retain their jobs or uh, give them income support uh, or extended health benefits and support. So these issues, you know, uh, have been a little bit in the backseat, I think, for most 
economic policymakers and economists over the years, you know, macroeconomic policy has been the big focus. But the pandemic has brought these, what you might think of as structural issues or more human related aspects of economic policy back to the fore. And the ILO has been in the thick of that uh, and has, uh, has had some uh, discussions and some policy uh, uh, guidance um, and some new initiatives that I think are, are prepared to make a difference in this regard, which I can describe in a bit later, a little bit later with some greater detail. No, please, Rick, go ahead. Describe Because I was going to ask you, what, what are you seeing specifically in terms of policy prescriptions and what trends are you seeing in other countries? So please. You know, I'd say at a, at a top line level, the big learning that we should be taking away from this experience is that we need to make our uh, economic policy and the way we evaluate the success of our respective national economies, more human-centered in focus. You know, the, the prevailing paradigm has been mainly about GDP, production, national production, and ways to improve the efficient allocation of resources um, through market signals to be able to enlarge the national economic productive pie, if you will. That's important. Growth is important. It's hard for everybody to get a bigger piece of the pie if the pie isn't growing, if you will, and the population's growing. But um, focusing more on these human-related aspects of things, I think, is the most important thing that we're, we're learning from this uh, crisis. So a couple of years ago, the ILO, uh, thinking about its 100-year anniversary in 2019, had a big think about, all right, well, what have we learned? What's important going forward as we see some of the big changes in the world economy? Automation, artificial intelligence, climate change and net zero commitments, population aging, changes in geopolitics that are, are disrupting or modifying uh, trade patterns and investment patterns and supply chains. These are big secular forces affecting all economies to one degree or another. What What's, what's the agenda going forward to help countries navigate through these big structural transformations? And at the end of the day, the, the, the conclusion was that is in fact, remedying or redressing an underinvestment in people that has been prevailing over the past generation or so. Countries, including notably the United States, have not really been investing sufficiently in their people, in their capabilities, in their ability to transition from one job to another, in their social protection, the social safety net and the like, um, in the in productive employment opportunities in the real economy, as opposed to things that are a bit more fleeting and transitory uh, and the like. And this so-called human-centered approach to the future of work uh, is an approach that was laid out in some detail in policy terms and has set the course for the organization going forward into the next centenary, the next hundred years. Um, and has become uh, newly important, even more important, I think, in the pandemic, given the increase in inequality that has just uh, expanded as a result of the pandemic. And Rick, do you see, I mean, you're part of these conversations with governments, with employer associations, with worker associations. Do you see the political will to actually change and invest in a human-centered economy? I don't know yet. It's, uh, it's a little early to tell whether we're in a moment, in a crisis, and, and therefore there's a lot of vocalized recognition of this weakness in the way we've been running our economies. Uh, so it, it's still, I'd say, an open question as to whether that will translate into a longer-term shift in priorities. We have been trying to spell out what that would look like and to add a degree of accountability. You know, um, I think I like to say that the, the recovery um, shouldn't be evaluated purely on the basis of whether uh, you see the quarterly growth numbers, GDP growth numbers improve, or even if you see um, unemployment rates decline. There's a lot more to the story behind that you need, that you need to look at. Are people's incomes recovering? Um, are, is the labor force participation rate growing? Are people coming into the workforce like they were before the pandemic struck? Or are people getting discouraged and are becoming inactive in this regard? Uh, you know, there, there's a much more textured story here uh, to 
effecting a truly inclusive and broad-based recovery and a, a more human-centered, uh, more fully inclusive, more sustainable model of growth and development than just by looking at those traditional top-line numbers you see in the news in the financial pages of the newspapers. So I know that you've spent a good deal of your career um, in, in Geneva and outside the United States, but I'm just going to, I know you're focused also on the U.S. Um, do you think Build Back Better, President Biden's legislation, um, if it were to pass, would, would help to drive a more human-centered economy? I think this particular legislation is about making, for the, in the main, increased investment in areas of structural policy that would make a difference for people's ability to engage in the workforce and to have progress in their incomes and in their living standards. So I see from what I can tell from this uh, legislative package, it is an investment agenda um, that uh, would appear to be appropriate by our estimation of uh, trying to redress some of the imbalances I spoke about uh, earlier. Yes. Well, Rick, it's always wonderful to talk to you. I learn so much each time we have a conversation. So I want to thank you for joining us at State of Play today. Thank you very much, Karen.